of introducing our speaker today. It is a real pleasure to have Professor William Hintz, Bill Hintz, with us this morning to talk about fluoride thr thresholds uh, to protect fresh waters. Um, Bill tells us that he is originally from Minnesota, and based on what he tells us, I think it's an authentic account. Having grown up in the Waseca area and um, a lot of ice fishing escapades up near Lake Malax, he says, Bill is going to talk to us about uh, the ecological impacts of road de-icing salts and uh, new evidence that he thinks indicates that um, ecological impacts can occur at very low salt concentrations and should prompt us to be rethinking existing chloride thresholds and, um, and uh, in his words, maybe develop new ones. Bill Hintz is a freshwater scientist at the University of Toledo's Lake Erie Center. He received his bachelor's and master's degrees from the University of Wisconsin-Eau Claire and eventually a PhD from Southern Illinois University. He uh, studies more broadly the impacts of pollution, invasive species, and climate change on freshwater ecosystems. So uh, before um, we turn it over to Bill Brook, is there anything being our um, kind of go-to person in terms of chloride contamination of water that you would uh, like to preface our seminar speaker with today? Well, I just want to thank um, Bill for joining us. I'm really um, grateful that he accepted my invitation. So those of you who know me are probably not surprised that I'm the one that <laughs> uh, reached out and secured the speaker. I had the opportunity to hear him present uh, this at the SALT Symposium back in August. And I, of course, was very intrigued and um, thought that this would be uh, valuable information for everybody um, to, to learn more about and hear from because I think it's some really great interesting research. So um, I'm just excited to have um, him join us today and, and share his great work. So let's get going. Yeah, Bill, I, the, the floor is now yours. You can run it from your end. Well, well thank you, Mark and Brooke. If you, anyone has difficulty hearing me, please just chime in or if something happens with the slides. Um, you know, I appreciate being with you all today. As Mark mentioned, um, born and raised in Minnesota. So, you know, ecological issues um, in Minnesota are, are pretty near and dear to my heart. And one of those issues, as, as a lot of you know, is, is the rising salinity of freshwater ecosystems. And so um, I'll talk a little bit about that today and then maybe some new work on thresholds, um, chloride thresholds in freshwater ecosystems and how protective they are. So to get started, if you keep your fingers on the, the pulse of the scientific literature, um, you'll probably see a lot more headlines like this and papers like 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 this, right? Um, the the salinity of freshwater ecosystems is increasing fairly dramatically, um, and and there's a whole host of issues contributing to the rising salinity of freshwaters. Um, and so, we you know scientists have kind of been warning us about this issue since the mid 1970s. There's a couple papers published in I think 1975 if memory serves, that indicate that road salt contaminated ecosystems could cause the release of mercury from contaminated sediments. And so we think about how long ago that was and, and kind of compiling those ecological issues now. Um, I, I think, you know, the exponential increase in scientific attention to this issue is, is, is a really good thing. And I think we need to make progress um, on addressing the issue. So for those of you, you know, that may not be aware, I mean, salinization, I think this crew is probably, you know, clear on this definition, but it's essentially just the accumulation of soluble salts in freshwater ecosystems. And I'll be talking a little bit about road salts, but there's a host of other uh, contributors to the rising salinity of freshwater ecosystems. There's agricultural induced salinization which you know, on a lot of our farm fields will put different fertilizers, things like potassium chloride, so on and so forth. Um, mining operations, you know, when we pull massive amounts of, of material from the earth you know, during precipitation events, salts in those tailings can um, dissolve and be washed into adjacent surface waters and groundwaters. And then there's climate-induced salinization. And, and I think about you know, a recent news article where the Mississippi River is, is down, right? 
and the Gulf of Mexico, there's a lot of saltwater intrusion coming up, you know, the lower Mississippi River, threatening drinking water supplies and fresh water access um, for people in, in southern Louisiana. So, you know, it's a global problem. There are a lot of issues and, and it's probably high time, you know, we, we think hard on this issue. Um, the news media has been, you know, also paying attention to this issue and, and the news headlines, um, you know, sometimes can be a little sensational, but um, I think they get to the point about what the science is telling us, right? That salinization could be a potential, you know, um, pretty severe issue, not only for organisms and freshwater ecosystems, but our drinking water supplies. And so when we think about road de-icing salts, I'm gonna to try to move this little, I think I have the WebEx thing in here, so I apologize if it covers up some of this stuff and I have to move it temporarily. Um, when we think about salinization from road salts, you know, road salts are, are very necessary um, for our safety and, and they reduce accident rates by more than 78% uh, by some estimates. So, you know, we have to, you know, finding that balance between using something that is, is 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 leading to, you know, negative ecological impacts, but increases our safety, it, it's it's not an easy thing to deal with. When we look at road salt, um, you know, the need for road salts in in the United States, you know, regions that get snow and ice. I mean, that's where seventy percent of the population and seventy percent of the road networks exist in these cold regions. So, especially in the United States, you know, it's a pretty big issue. When we think about how much road salt is applied, um, you know, it's a lot and it's been steadily increasing since about 1975. So, if we look at in any, any given year, maybe as recently as 2015, um, we applied, you know, 66 billion pounds of just sodium chloride de-icer. Um, that, that's a lot. And, and being from Minnesota, you know, the proverbial UFTA, right? Um, it, it's, that's a lot of salt going down on road networks and that salt has to go somewhere, right? When we try to contextualize this a little bit, um, whoops, I apologize. When we try to contextualize this a little bit, you know, I like to think of a small kitchen table that I had in college, which was about one yard by one yard. Um, so, you know, we think about almost a square meter. You know, that's that can be upwards of 82 pounds, or sorry, 18.2 pounds per square meter by some estimates in the literature. Um, so imagine, you know, your small kitchen table and 18.2 pounds of salt, just dumping your table salt. And that's 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 that covers about every square meter of, of road networks in some areas annually. Um, I was just speaking to a student, a master student at Yale University, uh, and and they are estimating that that some of this is actually quite a bit higher um, on some road networks out east, upwards of, of 24 to 28 pounds. Um, so that's a lot of salt going on our roads every single year. This is where I study the impacts of road de-icing salts. Um, this is the Lake Erie Center and, and the white on the parking lot. I apologize if this header is sticking around here. Uh, it's kind of hard to see the titles on the slides. There it goes. So when we think about how much salt is applied, um, this, this is a private applicator on our parking lot and sidewalks at the Lake Erie Center. This was during the winter, right before Christmas. I had to cancel coming home to Minnesota because COVID. Um, so I was just out, um, you know, at the research center and, and kind of drove into the parking lot and this is what it looked like. Now it was about, it was hovering just above freezing um, and it ended up being a 38 degree day in rain. So this was anticip in anticipation of a storm event from a private applicator and, and all of this essentially just washed off the parking lot and sidewalks. And if you look at the, the picture on the right, just over those trees is Lake Erie. Um, and, and our drinking water intake is, is just offshore there a couple miles. So um, that's a lot of salt that didn't go to 
serve any de-icing um, uh, purpose. And this is, you know, if you go to a shopping malls, parking lots, sometimes I go to breakfast, um, you know, before we go to campus and, and parking lots in the wintertime look like this all the time. And, and sometimes we're not yet reaching the freezing point. Um, and so I think we need to think about, you know, some smart application strategies, not just for public road operations, but private. And so I had the privilege of spending uh, a, a good deal of time with, with SALT applicators and things like that, um, and, and people like that, road managers, a couple of weeks ago. And, and, you know, we, you know, why so much salt? And I think, you know, we're all kind of to blame, right? It, it's, it's partially our demand for clear roads and, and transportation um, moving towards, you know, getting to work. Um, we, we don't want to slow down. I think when we think about something called the level of service, Minnesotans are generally pretty good about, you know, taking it easy during adverse winter conditions. But in a lot of areas of the country, road managers have stated that it's the public pressure campaign to keep the roads free and clear um, and not receive a ton of phone calls and pressure from local politicians or higher level politicians to keep the roads absolutely spotless during adverse winter conditions. So I think we all kind of share a role in, in the amount of de-icing salt being applied to our roads, both publicly and privately. When we think about our biggest freshwater ecosystems, you know, um, I think, you know, Chapra and company have published a couple of great papers illustrating that even the Great Lakes are increasing in their salinity. And so this isn't all due to road de-icing salts. This is due to several, you know, industrial sources also. Um, but road salts can play a big role. And there's been several papers published on this issue uh, um, in the Great Lakes. I think of Hillary Dugan's paper at the University of Wisconsin uh, talking about salt loading into Lake Michigan. Our lake, Lake Superior, is still steadily low, but if we look at other lakes like Lake Erie in Ontario and even Michigan, you know, we kind of have an upward trend in the last decade or two. So, um, so my lab um, at the University of Toledo, you know, we really try to understand the ecological impacts of road de-icing salts once they get into freshwater ecosystems. And as I tell all my ecology students, you know, freshwater ecosystems are interconnected. Right. If you want to fish for bass, you better make sure that conditions are right for, you know, the healthy growth and recruitment of bass in freshwater ecosystems. And that requires a host of different food resources, right? Invertebrates, things like that, uh, zooplankton. And so what we try to understand is the direct and indirect effects of uh, road salts in freshwater ecosystems. And one way we do this is with mesocosm studies. We also do a wide variety of laboratory tox tests and, and, and pretty ideal laboratory conditions. But um, a lot of our work is based um, on mesocosm studies. And in these studies, you know, we can manip manipulate the ecological community. We can manipulate the salt concentration um, and, and, and kind of draw inference from those studies. When we look at, um, you know, the food web that we can populate in these tanks, um, we can get pretty complex. And so everything from quantifying abiotic variables to up to fish species, um, we put a host of filter feeders, grazers, phytoplankton, uh, paraphyton, macroalgae, so on and so forth. And we can populate each mesocosm with an experimental food web, like you see there on the left, um, or, or any kind of ecological community. And we usually take these organisms from natural environments, right? A lot of these aren't going to be laboratory strains, um, you know, which, which have a place, but most of these are just wild type strains. So when we think about some of the ecological impacts from those studies, um, and I'll kind of go through some impacts at higher concentrations, um, you know, we can see, you know, an effect of salt on the abundance of, of amphipods. And, and amphipods, I, I don't want to reduce them to just fish food because I think amphipods are pretty cool. Um, but in, in our studies, we see that as we increase salt concentration, you know, we get to about 500 milligrams of chloride per liter. And, and we've already seen a, about a 31% reduction in amphipod abundance and anything higher than that, um, almost a total loss. And so when we think about 
you know, benthic organisms in freshwater ecosystems and maybe organisms people don't really, maybe not care about, I care about them, but not everybody does. Um, you know, these are critically important food resources for a lot of the resources we do value, right? As, as a society, things like yellow perch. I mean, I fish for yellow perch in, in Mille Lacs quite a bit, you know, playing cribbage and, and, and things like that and fishing yellow perch, it's, it's a good meal. Um, in our field studies, we find that amphipods are one, this is from a lake out in the Adirondack Park in New York, uh, yellow perch consume amphipods in droves, right? And amphipods are one of the most important diet items uh, for yellow perch in this lake. And so when we think about highly contaminated systems affecting the abundance of amphipods, uh, you know, it's not just the amphipods. We need to start thinking and, and scaling up and scaling down to try to understand some of these ecological impacts. And so one thing we're working on is trying to model, you know, when we lose certain resources at certain salt concentrations, how might that affect, you know, like on the right here, will that affect the growth and lead to smaller adults, fewer adults? Because we get fewer, smaller offspring. So when we see ecological impacts like this and we try to scale that up, these are, you know, these are some of those modeling questions we're trying to answer. But um, it's not just about the loss of amphipods. Let's think, you know, in a community context here. When we look at things like macroalgae, we, we had an experiment and you see this, this tank up on the upper left and you can kind of see this, this uh, carophyte, freshwater carophyte, this macroalgae species. And as we increase salt concentration in these tanks, we see that at about 250 milligrams of chloride per liter, pretty close to that 230 threshold, right? Um, you know, almost a, a loss of half of the carophyte biomass. And so as we increase salt concentration, we see that it almost disappears at really high salt concentrations. And, and I don't think we understand much about how freshwater macrophytes or freshwater macroalgaes will respond. Things like nitella in lakes of the Anirondack Park, for example, they're critically important to, to the, the functioning of the ecosystem and ecological communities in those lakes. So um, this was kind of a surprising re result that we discovered, but we really don't understand how other macroalgae species and macrophyte species will respond to increasing salinity. And then there are the indirect effects, which maybe we'll discuss here in a minute. In streams, um, in stream ecosystems, you know, they exhibit the highest road salt concentrations out of any freshwater ecosystems. Um, and we conducted a study with rainbow trout uh, that you see here um, and what we did is we exposed rainbow trout alvins to three different salt types for about 25 days. And, and you can see the control um, on, on the left there. And so we look at fish length and fish mass over that 25 day period. Um, we didn't see much of an effect of magnesium chloride on, on trout growth and development. But once we get to the really high concentrations of sodium chloride, um, we, we see a pretty noticeable reduction in growth. And then for calcium chloride, you know, when we expose, you know, these are the three most common de-icing salts, right? And in and, and states like New Hampshire, I think they solely use calcium chloride. That's the only salt type I think they use as of a few years ago. So, you know, you can see at a much lower concentration, calcium chloride has a much greater impact on fish size um, in this instance. And so, to try to contextualize this, when we take those alvins there in the middle and we expose them to high road salt concentrations, you really see, you know, a noticeable reduction in the size of these individuals um, later in life. So the question becomes, you know, how well do our current thresholds protect, you know, freshwater organisms? And 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 all over the world, there are several thresholds designed to protect freshwater environments and organisms. And, and Canada, you know, has the lowest federal threshold of 120 milligrams of fluoride per liter. And in the United States, I think you're all familiar with this, we have the 230 milligram of fluoride per liter threshold. Um, in, in Europe, uh, they're a bit more sparse, uh, but, you know, in Germany, they consider 
water is contaminated with 50 to 200 milligrams slightly polluted and 200 to 400 moderately polluted. But, you know, these thresholds might give us a good benchmark for saying, okay, you know, this is where some of the more sensitive freshwater organisms might elicit a negative effect. And so, um, not to pick on the state of Michigan or anything, but it's the closest state um, to where I'm at that has as recently modified their chloride thresholds. And, and so some of the recent thresholds in Michigan state that no water should exceed 500 milligrams of total of, of dissolved solids, you know, public water supply to exceed 125 milligrams per liter of chloride. And then any great lake and connecting water should not exceed 50 milligrams of chloride per liter. Uh, just over the border where I'm at in Toledo, we've been measuring chloride um, kind of throughout the Maumee area of concern. Um, and so here in Northwest Ohio, if you look at this, uh, some of this is color coded, but I apologize to those of you um, that have difficulty seeing colors. Uh, what we have is that each dot, it's a, it's a sampling site and the number next to it is the chloride concentration milligrams of chloride per liter. So we're seeing pretty high concentrations in, in Northwest Ohio. And, and that's, you know, some of it's due to development, right? Um, there's agricultural induced salinization, road salt induced salinization, so on and so forth, um, and, and probably a host of other sources. But it's clear that even some of the connecting waters to the Great Lakes are, are above 50. Um, we did measure one concentration at 52 milligrams of chloride per liter in the Western Basin of Lake Erie. That was kind of in the Maumee River plume um, flowing into the Western Basin. So, you know, we're kind of already at some of these higher concentrations in, in, in various locations. So the question becomes, you know, do chloride thresholds protect freshwater organisms? And I think, you know, we are in desperate need of a, a broad scale test. And, and if we look at this graph on the left, we see that the number of lakes approaching the different chloride thresholds set in Canada and the United States, the frequency of those lakes is increasing. So a group of researchers from uh, Canada, Europe, and across the United States got together and conducted a study on, on the impacts of sodium chloride, which is the most commonly used de-icing salt. Um, in, 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 in other operations, it's, it's just a common pollutant um, in our freshwater ecosystems. So, you know, from California, Northeastern United States, Great Lakes region, then across Europe, we had these 16 study sites where we took uh, zooplankton um, communities from natural lake ecosystems and exposed them to a gradient of, of chloride uh, derived from sodium chloride. And so you can see the experimental design on the bottom of the slide here. We went from really, really low control concentrations of a lot of the lakes um, were very low. All lakes were below 18 milligrams per liter of chloride. Um, and so we exposed them from, you know, the base control concentration in the lake all the way up to about 15 mil 1500 milligrams per liter. And again, we conducted this either um, in situ experiments or in lake experiments, mesocosm experiments or land based mesocosm experiments. Um, that's one of my undergrads you see on the right there. Um, that helped me out with this experiment. So take zooplankton communities from natural lakes, natural systems, expose them to a regression style design, a gradient of salt concentrations. And for those of you that are um, data junkies out there, uh, this, these are what the data look like. Um, I'll, I'll show you a series of graphs, but the next few graphs are gonna be derived from these data here. So when I just pulled out a few panels the, the black line, for instance, is the change in, in, in abundance of clodosterins from the low to high salt concentrations. And the green line is on the second y axis is algal biomass. So we have, you know, zooplankton, one of their functional roles is to, you know, they consume a lot of algae in freshwater ecosystems. And so using generalized additive modeling, we can kind of understand. You know, the nonlinear patterns in, in the response of zooplankton to salt concentrations. So, using those data, we can ask the question at the Canadian threshold of 120 or the US threshold of 230, what is the percent change in abundance of, in this case, clodosterins, right? These are the large body grazers in lake ecosystems. Um, what is the percent change in abundance 
you know, at these thresholds based on those data that I just showed you. And so you see the vast majority of study sites across North America and Europe exhibited a pretty substantial decline in abundance of, of clodosterin zooplankton. And, and a few sites, you know, we saw an increase actually. So I've kind of taken the liberty to show a 50% decline line there. And we see, you know, at the 230 threshold, there's there's a lot of sites um, where the percent changes is, is near 75%. Um, and so this is this is this was actually pretty surprising um, uh, when we started analyzing these data. So anything below that dashed line is a decrease, anything above it is an increase. When we look at other taxonomic groups of zooplankton, the calanoids and cyclopoids, it's the same story, right? Um, the calanoid copepods tended to be a little bit more susceptible, it appears, than, than the cyclopoid copepods. Um, some of the cyclopoid copepods, we couldn't estimate um, a percent change in abundance because as soon as we added salt to the tanks, they just disappeared. Um, so, you know, you can't estimate something that when you increase the concentration of a contaminant, it, it just disappears. There's no, it's not really a mathematical way to do that. Um, rotifers were a little bit more tolerant, like cyclopoid copepods, but we still see a general trend of declining rotifer abundance um, at, at the vast majority of study sites. So, um, and that's, you know, every dot is either at the Canadian or US threshold. When we try to estimate, you know, the LC50 based on a 50% reduction from the control with our statistical models, um, these are what the data look like. And, and back to clodosterins here for a moment, um, we, we see that the estimated LC50 um, and it's associated 95% confidence interval. You know, a lot of sites overlap are at or are below um, those thresholds of 230 and 120 milligrams of chloride per liter. Um, when we think about um, calanoid copepods, you know, almost every site with the exception of one either saw calanoids kind of disappear or their, their average response, their, their mean LC50 plus or minus the confidence interval overlap with those chloride thresholds. So, um, Then, you know, when we lose those large body grazers, uh, zooplankton grazers at 47% of those study sites, um, we saw an increase in algal, algal biomass measured as chlorophyll A. So, you know, in our control systems, when we increase that, that salt concentration, we, we've kind of almost observed this greenish hue at a lot of different sites and, and and when we measure chlorophyll A, we see this, this noticeable increase in algal biomass. Um, could be more chlorophyll A per algal cell too, but um, that remains to be understood. So if you're gonna ask me, um, you know, I think we need to rethink some of these chloride thresholds for certain lake ecosystems. You know, our results differ from a lot of um, laboratory toxicity tests. Um, which generally have ideal conditions, and, and rightfully so, to get at, you know, what is the impact of the contaminant, right? And, and those, those studies have, are hugely immensely valuable as, as we move forward. But when we look at studies using wild strains and we have natural species interactions occurring in communities, um, you know, we see a pretty noticeable um, effect at these thresholds or below these thresholds. And so, one of our thoughts was that dilute lakes, lakes really low in water hardness, lakes with very low calcium concentration were um, maybe one way to explain why, you know, some zooplankton communities kind of collapse at these thresholds. Um, and, and I think we're trying to figure that out, but so many lakes exhibited such a dramatic decline, it's tough when you're analyzing those data to find a signal because a lot of the lakes just declined and, and, and we didn't really detect an effect of calcium. So there's, there's a lot of questions that remain about the background water chemistry of lakes and whether they're more or less susceptible to salt pollution. And, and you know, in, in my mind, I think about everything else in the water. Uh, think about, you know, pesticides and all the other stressors in aquatic ecosystems. And this is just looking at sodium chloride. So 
we do need a multiple stressor approach in my view to to thinking about chloride and salt pollution because there's nutrient pollution there's other stressors invasive species and so how you know how do we move forward on that and, and that's still an open question in my mind and, and worth discussion so we, we are not the only ones and and not the first paper to find that that Road salt can, you know, negatively affect zooplankton at low um, chloride concentrations. And some great work by Shelley Arnott and John Small out of Canada is showing that zooplankton can, um, if you look at this little snippet from their paper recently in 2020, um, you know, some of those aquatic herbivores can exhibit a decline at five to forty milligrams of chloride per liter, and, and that's that's really low. Um, and I think. You know, that kind of gets us thinking about, well, why in those lakes and why not every lake or every community? Um, some work by Rachel Value and, and John Small, <clears throat> you know, also shows that, you know, an LC50 for a few species in some of the Canadian Shield lakes, you know, is 23 to 60 milligrams of chloride per liter. And that, you know, neonate or offspring production was reduced and suppressed at concentrations as low as 15 milligrams of fluoride per liter. So um, a lot of support for that. Um, when we think about not everything's just about survival growth and things like that. You know, I showed you a reduction in growth of, of rainbow trout at really high salt concentrations, but there's also behavioral changes. You know, do some fish species avoid salt plumes um, in streams or rivers? And so this paper by Ray Morgan in 2012 um, showed that, you know, at 33 to 108 milligrams of chloride per liter, there were noticeable changes in, in, in fish assemblages. So, you know, fish probably aren't going to die at that concentration. You're not maybe going to see a reduction in growth, but as a salt plume or as an elevated salt concentration, would that trigger behavioral changes or avoidance behaviors? In, in some freshwater organisms. So as we think about, you know, death and growth and things like that, it, there's some subtle, you know, sublethal effects, I think, that we need to really start thinking about. Um, so if we could try putting this all together, um, you know, what are the indirect effects? You know, if we look at the lake food web here on the right, we get a reduction in zooplankton diversity and abundance. Increase algal concentration, you know, could that have shading effects on benthic environments and lakes? We know that some benthic organisms like amphipods are susceptible to high salt concentrations and in a lot of lake ecosystems, the highest salt concentrations are measured on the bottom of lakes. Um, you know, the inflow of the salt effluent can kind of settle on the bottom of lakes and leave this saline briny layer um, at the bottom of lakes. And ultimately, as we try to scale up, could you see a reduced, you know, fish growth and abundance or behavioral changes? Um, so as we look at the food chain on the left, you know, we know zooplankton can be affected at low concentrations, but how will that scale up or scale down? What are the top down bottom up effects? And, and I always like to show the picture of my sister's husband with a musky, you know, he tours around Minnesota and, and Wisconsin looking for musky all the time, um, you know, a lot of resources that, that are extremely valuable to us as a society um, that we need to think about here. So I, I say beyond the ecology, but we humans are part of that ecology, right? And, and I've seen a lot of different estimates in the scientific literature on, on the economic costs of, of all of this to our roads and infrastructures. And, and I think some of these estimates come out of Minnesota, right? Um, you know, a recent one I saw was, you know, every dollar spent on a road de-icing salt triggers $10 in damage to our infrastructure. Um, and so I think when we think about the ecological impacts, we also need to kind of fold in those, those infrastructure issues as well and the cost to maintaining our roads. But, you know, one of the things that I think is more concerning is the economic costs to our drinking water supplies. There, there's several case studies where wells are no longer usable in New York, and, and I don't know how many in Minnesota, or I've heard of some in Illinois um, and some here in Ohio, 
where wells, you know, downstream of road networks, you know, the road salt washes into the leachate fields and, and you know, the, the, the salt concentration in well fields is just too high. Um, and so, you know, that's, that costs a lot of money to fix. And then this is just a simple thing of, of water clarity. Uh, I used to recreate in northern Minnesota a lot. Um, you know, those lakes are probably still pretty dilute, right? I mean, they're not, the salt concentration is still probably pretty low in, in areas where, you know, that are fairly remote, which is a good thing. But, you know, there's a lot of areas um, that lakes, you know, they're increasing their salinity quite a bit. You know, and if we lose some of the zooplankton um, in those lakes and we get, more turbid, maybe higher algal concentrations. I just think about the simple thing of, of, of water clarity and Jake Walsh from the University of Wisconsin published a paper back in 2016 that puts a valuation on water clarity uh, based on um, invasive species, you know, impacts kind of altering water clarity. And when we think about one meter of water clarity, you know, the valuation on that is about 140, you know, million dollars. So, you know, there's a lot to think about here in terms of, you know, it's not just about our amphipods going to disappear from a stream ecosystem or a wetland or a lake. Um, you know, there's a lot of things that, you know, humans um, value. So, you know, the, I mean, best management practices, a lot of people, you know, in this organization are probably very familiar with this. And I think, you know, Minnesota is one of the states kind of leading the way in this, you know, I've heard some great efforts in in Chicago and, and Wisconsin. Uh, and when you think about it, we still need road de-icing salts for our own safety. Um, but implementing best management practices, which which I assume a lot of this crew is familiar with, um, you know, these things can reduce the need for de-icing salt up to like 80%, right? So implementing these best management practices. Um, can really help us reduce salt loading into freshwater ecosystems. And, and I think while there are a lot of local efforts, you know, leveraging these best management practices, uh, we need more broad scale adoption of these management practices to reduce salt loading into freshwater ecosystems and, and kind of curb those, those, those ecological impacts where they might be occurring. And, and we are working on this in, in Northwestern Ohio. We have a collaboration running with some local um, organizations and, and the Ohio EPA and federal EPA. And so um, those salt concentrations I showed you earlier in the presentation in Northwest Ohio, we are working on implementing those best management practices, a lot of public outreach, public education, um, and working with applicators and road managers to kind of curb this, curb the, the influx of salts into our, our surface and groundwaters. So with that, I, I just wanna thank that, that a lot of the research you saw today is, is, is due to a lot of undergrads and technicians. So I just wanna give them a shout out um, and some great collaborators, uh, the study, um, the North American European study that, that I showed you, um, you know, that was really kind of led by Shelley Arnott at Queens University in Canada and, and was the work of a lot of people you know, across across the U.S., Canada, and, and Europe. So I want to give them a shout out, as well as the Gleon organization for kind of facilitating you know communications. Okay, um, that's that's all I have. I, I, I think you know I have to take off at eleven here, but um, feel free to reach out. My contact information is here in the upper upper right, and if you want to talk about road salt or any of the research you saw here today, and we don't have a chance to. In the next 15, 20 minutes or so, um, you know, just let me know. Thank you. Great, thank you, Bill. I we do have um, at least two questions, um, which I think you answered one right as you were um, uh, finishing up your PowerPoint slides here. We do have a, a, ch a question in the chat from Scott asking why are some lakes seeing an increase in abundance with higher chloride in your twenty twenty two uh, PNAS study. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's a good question. Um, you know, it's quite possible. Sometimes we can see kind of competitive, competitory or predatory release in ecological communities. So. In some communities, what we've seen is like when the cladocerans disappear, we'll get a major increase in, in, um, 
in other species. So when sensitive species decline, you know, the more dominant species can take off. And, and we don't really know, we haven't tweezed apart those interactions yet. There are some groups, you know, we don't have a handle on the, the local gene pools, so to speak, that, you know, some groups of organisms in some regions may just be more salt tolerant if they're, you know, near ocean spray or things like that. And so why they increased is, is unclear. Um, you know, it could be due to competitive or predatory release in some way, shape or form. Could be, you know, that they're, they're, they just have a higher tolerance in that region for, for unknown reasons. Um, you know, there is some evidence in the scientific literature that, that, you know, an exposure history can confer a tolerance to zooplankton communities. And then there's other scientific evidence that that tolerance won't really mitigate the ecological impacts. Um, so I think, you know, there's a there's a lot of species within a zooplankton community, and and you know some of those species in some regions are going to be much more tolerant than than other species in other regions. So um, yeah, I think that that kind of is a burning question, right? Is why why would one lake exhibits such a dramatic decline or most lakes and some lakes kind of exhibit a, a hermetic effect or something, you know, that, that we don't yet understand. And then we did have a question here. Um, if the global study was done with Gleon, but it looks like you had that slide up there. So I don't know if there was any further clarification needed on that or further questions. Uh, yeah, this, I mean, if, if someone's asking about the Gleon, you know, this was kind of spawned at Gleon um, in, in 2018, the ideas were, were thrown around and, and everybody got together um, at a Gleon meeting to discuss it. So it's nice having groups like that facilitate studies like this. And we've got another question here from Carl. Um, that uh, he finds the economic reference points helpful in making arguments. Um, one meter of water quality equals 140 million. Can you say more about Jake Welsh's study? Is that dollar amount based upon a one meter impact across all lakes across the entire US? Mm -hmm. That was based, I think, in the Yahara Lakes region in, in Wisconsin. So um, that study kind of looked at how the spiny water flea through its consumption of, of clodocerins, which can trigger a cascading effect, um, how that can lead to reductions in water clarity. And then so that paper was published in PNAS in, in 2016. Um, and I think it's it's titled like invasive species triggers massive loss of ecosystem services or something like that. So uh, I'd be happy to provide the paper for you, but there are other valuations of water clarity in the scientific literature. And I think when we talk about ecological impacts, you're, you're very right. Um, we need to think about the economic impacts and, and often in my, in my classes or just giving talks or communicating with people in groups like this, it's, it's okay. We have an ecological impact, but what does that mean to people? And, and that can help with publication or with um, education and outreach. Um, and, and getting public support behind um, an issue. So, so yeah, I mean, valuations of 140 min, you know, million dollars per meter loss of water clarity, that's, that's tangible, right? Yeah, and I'll even just add that we have found in the Smart Salting Training Program that now that we've got, we did a study a few years ago to better understand the economic impacts of salt use on infrastructure damage. And that really resonates with certain audiences who, um, you know, maybe not necessarily don't care about the environment, but that's not their highest priority or their highest concern. And so when we present those dollar figures in our smart salting for property management training, um, it really helps engage that audience more because they're the ones dealing with that every day, you know, fixing the carpet. I'm having to spend the money to repair vegetation and the sidewalks. And so I think that, you know, any way that we can, as an environmental community, find these more on the ground kind of things that speak to a wide range, like cost. Um, I think that is just helps us all in our efforts. Um, yeah. we, we have a, a comment here from Baishali, just thanking you for your presentation. Um, 
there's no question in there, but just saying how important uh, your work is contributing also um, to this freshwater salinization. I know that's been a, a lot of research on that and that we also heard from at the Salt Symposium, of course. So I'll just make a plug for any of you who are um, ever interested in really learning more about chloride, the Salt Symposium um, that is hosted every August really brings in some fantastic speakers. Like we really do find the latest, greatest research going on in chloride. Um, and so I, I encourage you to check that out if you wanna stay on top of that. Um, let's see, do we have any other questions? I've got by Shali's is the last chat I see in there. Um, Mark. I'm gonna, betray, I'm gonna betray my ignorance here a little bit. Um, Bill, why is it? I've always been confused. Why is it that fluoride being completely soluble in water accumulates in lakes? Yeah, uh, you know, in yeah, it's a conservative tracer, right? I mean, salt is is you know, chloride accumulates because it's really not it's not biologically transformed in any way, shape, or form. Like some ions can be, you know. Um, Nutrients, for example, they're always taken up and transformed and, and can be put into biomass. Um, chloride is is really, you know, in hydrological studies, for example, residence time. I mean, chloride's, you know, a, a useful indicator of, 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 of that. So once chloride gets into a system, you know, it stays in solution and there's really, as far as I know, no real economically feasible way of getting it out with the exception of let's let's halt the loading and let it dilute over time. Well, the, so, the, the, the thing I'm confused about is that being soluble in water, I would think that it would flow out of a system as fast as, as the water itself would. So if you have water flowing out of a lake, obviously it's going to be, it's going to be flowing out in some way. I would think that the chloride would do that too, but chloride seems to accumulate instead of moving out of the system, if I understand it correctly. And so yeah, I never understood that. Yeah, I think it depends on the residence time in a given system. So like in a stream ecosystem, for example, the chloride accumulates in the hyperreic zone, right? And so that, that area underneath a stream and the groundwater surrounding a stream can be contaminated with salt. And when we get, um, when we get, rain events or things like that, that recharge the groundwater um, or hyperreic zone underneath the stream, you can get big salt plumes, even in the summertime, right? Because of that contamination. Now in wetlands and lakes, you know, it all depends what the inflow of salt is. Think, you know, you'd have to look at the water budget for any given system. You know, how much water is going in, how much is going out, how much salt going in, how much salt going out. And that will probably give you an idea of, of, of whether salt's going to accumulate or flow out. And so, you know, with residence times of, you know, I think eight years was the estimate I, I um, in the lake I work, worked at in the Adirondack Park, you know, salt was going in at a much faster rate in vast amounts, increasing that chloride concentration year after year after year after year. And so because it's not taken up and, and biologically transformed, it stays in solution. So if the if the water economy dictates that that chloride will stay there and the inputs are consistent, you will maintain high chloride concentrations. So even if we turn off the chloride or the salt into freshwater ecosystems, it's not gonna just drop immediately in a lot of lakes. It's 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 gonna be it's gonna stay there for a while. And that's gonna depend on the hydrology of the system, you know. The residence time, the water economy, water budget. And I'll just um, also add that there's been the University of Minnesota did a, a study back in 2007, 2008 that looked at several lakes in Minnesota. And we've got a couple of comments here in the chat about the density that salt water is heavier than fresh water. And so we definitely, um, in, in addition to that University of Minnesota data, we did a study with several local partners during the development of the Twin Cities metro area chloride TMDL. Um, to look at the chloride concentrations at the surface of the lake, as well as the deepest part of the lake. And in most of the lakes, we saw a pretty significant difference. And if you want an extreme example of that, you can look at Brownie Lake. Um, that lake is meromictic now, and the concentrations of chloride in the deepest part of that lake are 800 to 900 milligrams per liter. And I don't know how we're ever going to 
deal with that. However, we're going to fix that. That is maybe a potential situation where it's unfixable uh, just because it's a very um, deep lake with a narrow surface area. And so the, the outflow um, is, is a, just a challenge in general for that lake. But now that it's got such high concentrations of chloride sinking to the bottom because of its density, um, you know, that might be a, a poster child for <laughs> why we need to deal with this up front and not let it um, accumulate. Yeah, the, those examples uh, that come out of Minnesota there. So I think, yeah, that density gradient and that heavy, heavy, more dense, you know, salt water sinking to the bottom, that definitely is one reason why so many of those lakes exhibit high concentrations through time. And then, you know, for shallower systems, you know, you can still get those gradients, but a lot of lakes, a couple of lakes in Michigan too, I believe that that's occurred. So, so, so this is Scott Kaiser. I, I have a question. Um, so I know our agency has known for at least two decades that our 230 chloride standard is outdate, out, outdated and not appropriately protective. Um, and the EPA has known that for as, as long as well. Um, and I, I know personally I have been yelled at by, by, uh, by the public for saying that our, the, our 230 standard is probably too high and needs to be lowered. Um, I think that just the political reality is that advocating for a standard that is lower when we're not meeting 230 in a lot of waters is politically difficult. And I'm just wondering when you present your evidence, which is, you know, unimpeachable, right? There can be effects as, as low as five milligram per liter in ecosystems. Like, what do you hear from other people in other states about like the, you know, there's the science, which is clear, but then there's the reality of trying to adopt a standard, um, which is politically yeah. difficult for sure and and i think you know i don't have a great answer for you scott but i think you know the science is becoming clear and i think we need to ask ourselves you know do we need to work on regionally specific chloride standards like there are lakes maybe you're just going to lose to chloride in minnesota i don't know um you know can you protect all lakes in any given state or all waters in any given state, you know, by just lowering a blanket standard? I, that I don't know. I mean, could you develop TMDLs that have Clean Water Act protections to them that you say, okay, in this region, being from Minnesota, I'm just thinking the boundary waters or something like that, right? Um, you know, or, or in a certain set of lakes, do you have different standards than in other regions. I, I don't know what the what the answer to that is. Um, I think I know the state, the EPA in, in Ohio is working on lowering their thresholds, um, modifying their thresholds. Um, and so there's there's a lot of discussions going on. And if we've known it for decades, I guess, you know, the question I have is, are we going to wait two more decades? <laughs> you know, um, you know, we don't have to wait, but I think you know, we have to understand the nature of the problem too. Um, what lakes are affected? You know, we can only measure so many lakes. Um, and so there's a problem with funding to monitor enough surface waters to, to really fully understand the magnitude of the issue. I think, you know, a lot of the long-term data um, that has been published recently and a lot of systems are monitored, but, um, you know, I, I don't have an answer to the political question. I think, you know, when we think about our drinking water supplies, we better protect those because it's really not a chloride issue. It's a sodium issue for people that have hypertension, health issues, kidney issues. Um, so humans that have health issues, it's, it's the sodium that is going to be a problem. And in highly contaminated systems where we draw our water from, the sodium is probably already above 20 milligrams per liter. Um, you know, and, and so. I don't see a lot of sodium data out there either. I don't see a lot of sodium data available. And I think we need to address that as well. And once we show where we're drawing our drinking water from and sodium concentrations in those drinking water supplies, you know, that might be part of the impetus to, to, to modifying chloride thresholds. But um, I would say we probably don't want to wait another two decades to, to really start thinking about it. Um, and I wish there was an easy answer. Um, starts with conversation and, and I don't, you know, as, as an academic, you know, the political pressure is different for me. Uh, but 
Well, great. Thank you uh, so much for your time. We are um, coming right up to uh, the 10 o'clock or 11 o'clock for you. So I know that you do have to run. Um, we, we do have a, a question in here from Isam um, about lake mixing chloride concentrations um, that I don't know that you'll have time to answer because you, um, you have to take off, but. Um, well, no, I mean, I think we, you know, lake mixing, uh, we've seen lakes go meromictic, right? I mean, that's the, the Minnesota examples are, I think, as far as the literature goes, those are classic examples. Um, and so I think concentration can change on mixing. There's some evidence in like third sister lake in Michigan where you have, you know, the salt gradient kind of sets up and if something still turns over a little bit, that'll kind of the, the chloride concentration from top to bottom can be somewhat similar. Uh, so it all depends on the system and the salt loading. How, how contaminated is it? Is it so contaminated that you're gonna have that density gradient with those salt concentrations on the bottom or not? And if the if it's not high enough, you might see some change in the concentrations top to bottom. So pretty case case specific, I'd say. So well, thank you so much um, for your time. We really appreciate you sharing your research and your expertise with all of us. I think this was, of course, a wonderful uh, talk. Um, and uh, we, we look forward to, to hearing more about your research as you continue on this journey. So thank you so much for your time. Thanks for letting me be with you today. I really appreciate the invitation. So don't hesitate to reach out. And, and Scott, yeah, that, that comment you have, that's right on. So cool. Thank you all. Yes, thank you. Have a great day. Thanks, Kendall. Bye-bye. See you, Mark.